I'm Kazik, and you're listening to the Bacon Bits and Bites podcast. This is where a bit of business and a bite of technology come together. Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Bacon Bits and Bites podcast. And today I will be chatting with Danielle Meadow Stinnett. With over 10 years of marketing and multimedia agency experience, Danielle is a grassroots developer and curator, helping brand and launch over 75 local businesses across America, with the two thirds of them in Kentucky. Danielle is owner of the minority led branding agency Octane Design Studios, podcaster, mentor, wife, and mom, and lover of cosplay, comics, chai tea, air guitar solos, choral music, and live MMA. From designing full digital campaigns to designer sneakers, Danielle continues to amplify voices and stories to both inspire and evoke change. She's an advocate of non-traditional education, leading online meetups and workshops for DIY marketing. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to start off um, with your background. So how did you get into marketing? Um, it actually stemmed from this kind of this amazing journey um, with print journalism. I started out at Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, Kentucky, um, with a scholarship for journalism. And that was really my forte. Uh, I wanted to be the next Black Katie Couric. That was my goal um, in high school going into college. And I kind of slowly fell out of love with writing and more in love with design. And so as I'm picking up a lot of other marketing skills that come along with journalism, it just kind of molded into its own um, unique platform of, okay, I can switch easily now from writing to designing. So I took a look um, at your bio and you have been doing this for over 10 years. So what was the landscape like when you first started and how has it changed? Um, wow. Well, that's a great question. In a lot of ways, it's changed because I, I, everything evolves. You know, in this particular industry, everything changes within a matter of months. There's a quick turnaround for knowing what you need to know yesterday. Um, so that definitely has increased um, over time. Um, in the very beginning, everyone was kind of doing graphic design as a hobby and not really as a profession around me at that time. So when I began to better understand that actually I could actually use this talent, this gift in a way to actually increase my wealth, <laughs> then it became more realistic for me to uh, take it on on a more professional, professional level. But um, starting out, everyone was doing it as a hobby and now it's like everyone is doing it legitly. So now there's even more hunger to set yourself apart in the game. And when you first started, did you encounter any obstacles? Absolutely. And one of the earlier stories I love to share um, that I did in a, uh, one of my email e-blasts that I send um, on a weekly basis, I shared a story once when I first started building Octane Design Studios. Um, a lot of men would think that I was a male-owned business. And there was one particular instance where I was waiting to be set up for a business consultation and they literally were looking for a man. <laughs> that was the only woman in the waiting room to be seen um, by this particular client. So when they actually asked for Octane in the lobby and I got up and this is me, they were absolutely spellbound by the fact that <laughs> Octane was a woman um, and not a man. So um, we've come a long way since then, obviously. <laughs> but um, those are some of the, the different ways that Octane has grown and I have grown um, as far as digital marketing. I really love the name, by the way, like, you know, yeah. it, it sounds very like compelling. As you can tell, I guess, having the, the name, the Bacon Bits and Bites podcast, Making the Bacon, I'm a big fan of names and the stories behind them. Can yes. you share how you came up with the name? Was it just like an aha moment or over time you're like, oh, okay, I think this is a suitable name for my business? Well, at the time, uh, and I still am very much a very geeky scientific girl. And so I'd like to be able to think that this kind of was both an aha moment and a well duh moment. And <laughs> it was aha, uh, duh. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Like it really was like a okay, I get it. And a oh yeah. Um, I could have done that. Um, so that kind of started with me again 10 years ago. Um, I start, started out as a freelancer under DLM Designs, and it's just my initials. It's very common in the design industry when you're starting out to just use something basic as your name. And so that was what I was doing. And then over time, I just realized that I'm more than just my name. 
um, I could create a, a completely different platform away from my name and still be very intact and still provide the things that I wanted to provide to our clientele. So I kind of tugged at my noggin for a little bit about, you know, what could be it. And I am very obsessed with energy and the idea of flame and igniting things. And so yes. that came all together um, with the word octane. And if you are a super techie person listening to this, you would know that what color octane is when it's actually set on fire. Those are my branding colors. So it's really interconnected, this idea of um, seeing things when they're ignited and putting the right elements in place to ignite something bigger. Oh, I love it. Business and startups, we know that in this day and age, we need to do marketing. It's such a competitive world out there. It's such a noisy world. And it's so important more than ever to get yourself seen. What would you say are some common marketing mistakes that you see? I think common ones, most of all, would have to be one, not knowing what you're doing, obviously. That's a, I think that's the biggest one. We see a lot of startups when they get started. They're kind of all over the place. Um, they kind of have a lack of internal systems and processes. And that's, again, very common in startup businesses that are, you know, two or three years old. Feeling the need to do it all yourself, I feel like is a huge one because in a lot of ways we feel like we're doing it all ourselves, um, especially for techs and startups. When we talk about you know, people of color, specifically diversity in the tech industry. Um, I actually did some research recently from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and they specifically talk about how people of color make up roughly one third of employees in the tech industry. One percent of those are actually executive leads in the tech industry. That's astonishing to me because one, I'm surrounded by lots and lots of diversity in the tech industry, but I realize that that's only a remote part of... <laughs> of the bigger system here. And so when we talk about mistakes that people often make, it's not understanding the scalable part of the business, not realizing that, knowing when to look up, you know, knowing when to get out of your fish fresh, how to pivot. Um, those are some basic small things um, that I feel like a lot of startups tend to make in realizing they need to go big and hard um, straight out of the gate. Mm -hmm. But when they're first starting out, say, for example, um, they don't necessarily have the budget to outsource. Are there certain things that can DIY when it comes to marketing? Absolutely. Uh, we are huge advocates of non-traditional ed education at Octane. And I really strive hard for people to learn from one another, learn from what worked for one person and didn't work for another and apply that to yourself. There's so many different ways that you can do that. We host workshops, we have ebooks. There's so much different types of resources that people can obtain now in this age and time in comparison to a decade ago when it wasn't as common um, to really level up your business. Yeah, actually, that um, is one of the questions I have talking about, you know, non-traditional education versus traditional education. I remember traditional education. I remember back in the day when I was in university, which was quite a, a, a while ago. And I remember taking online courses, but they more referred to them as distance education. And it felt at that time, online courses were only something that colleges and universities offered. And now we're seeing so many people having like online workshops and then there's platforms such as like Skillshare, Udemy, LinkedIn, Learning, um, Coursera, etc. Do you see this becoming even like more of a trend now? People who have the skills to share creating online courses and then people who are hungry or see the need to learn certain skills to take these courses. Absolutely. I feel like in a lot of ways, we're actually starting to be more and more like other well-supported communities and countries who have done the same very well on their own decades before us. When you look at Europe, when you look at other countries like um, Italy and Spain, you look at their education and how they're growing. A lot of it is through internships and externships, which is, again, gaining experience by doing things on, on site or working hand in hand and more in a digital way. Um, so I feel like America is kind of just now getting to that point where we're like, oh, we can do that now. <laughs> we put so much emphasis on a formal education that we forget that some of the most innate experiences that we have in education is literally just doing the work. So I definitely feel online courses are definitely going to be the next level of um, education and we don't necessarily require um, a formal or four-year degree education. 
Mm -hmm. And for me personally, I'm actually not even using my degree. <laughs> so I have a, a degree in, in science, but I always joke to people that it's a, a very expensive piece of art that is in my parents' living room. And everything that I've been doing now has, the majority of it has been through YouTubing, asking around in Facebook groups, Googling, just asking people questions if you really want to learn something, you will uh, make the effort to, to find the means to do so. And yeah, because of the internet and social media, I, I believe that really you can learn pretty much anything. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I've leveled up my, my business. I've been able to level up my, my parenting skills, my, <laughs> my cosplay abilities, like all of this has come from some level of internet connection or some sort of group that I've been a part of. So I just feel like it has the beauty of technology is it does help foster communities. But the other part of that is actually using what you have learned and actually applying that. Yeah. And I think also people need to realize that like they have their own skill set like and there's so many things that that can be taught people might think like oh um i i don't have like skills in say for example like digital marketing but if they I, and i'm pretty sure like i i would say like if someone took an inventory of their skills their strengths and weaknesses they could probably find something to teach like i mean there are even courses on like say mindset and productivity which are a couple of like huge topics among entrepreneurs Absolutely. How to budget your time wisely. I mean, those are things that I have definitely searched for and used, and that's been to my benefit. So you also create online courses on Skillshare. So for people who are interested in creating online courses, do you have tips on how to create an effective online course? Definitely. Um, create a system that works for you. Um, that was something that I had to learn both the easy way and the hard way. Um, I was seeing how other people were doing it on their own, but really, it really comes down to what's comfortable for you. If you're not a person that is studious, don't make this project studious. <laughs> <laughs> if you're more laid back and you just want to have a conversation, set it up so that it is more of a conversation. Um, being true to yourself was really something that I wanted to come across um, in a lot of the online and non-traditional pieces that we put out. We don't necessarily want to make it feel like you're in a studious position. We want to make it more of a casual conversation between people who just want to share information. And so that's really what a lot of my base Skillshare classes, um, as well as online like Facebook group classes and things entail. Um, on our Skillshare class, we're talking about scaling to brand your work specifically. So the next one that I'm going to be putting out talks about building a brand guide for your clients or for yourself how to take a design and create a full-scale branding project from that one design. And again, you can follow Octane Designs for release dates and info on that specific information. But when we talk about breaking down the class, it literally is one, this is what we're talking about, to break down those top three things that we're going to be talking about and then wrapping that up in a um, practical um, way, giving them a homework assignment. Um, allowing them to interact with each other. I think that's a huge part of um, the online platform. That's really what it's all about is being able to interact with each other as you're growing. And then two, being able to show off your work. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed a lot of courses uh, do that where the students, they can ask questions to each other online. And I think that's really great, like, because it does help build the community and then also answer questions that other people might have. It's funny um, talking about Skillshare because I do have one uh, class up and, I, and I've been saying this for the past year and a bit that I will do another one, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Or, or actually, I guess a better way of putting it is that I haven't made it um, a priority. And I guess like for me, personally, I'm more of like audio audio person, video, not so much. It's a bit of a stretch for me. <laughs> I'm the same. And that really got me out of my comfort zone, actually, was doing more online, online courses. I am not a big fancy girl, makeup and doing all the things, um, talking all the, all the talk. I'm really just kind of playing Jane and I'm straightforward. And hopefully that comes off well to most of the people taking the courses. I believe it does. <laughs> but I'm also in a place too where um, when I'm authentically myself, other things like that does not bother me because I'm doing what I feel is, is compelling me to keep going. So in your bio, I mentioned that you designed uh, designer sneakers and, it, and that sounds really cool. Would you be able to share the experience with us? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so I had this really unique experience uh, a while back to work with some local brands on some fashion t-shirts and some fashion shoes. 
And it kind of went up a level um, when uh, one of my good friends that I work with on a different project called The Mix Magazine, she's a sneaker, she's a sneak freak. And she herself is very kind of higher up the ranks and working with Warner Brothers. And somehow, some way, she was able to connect um, Reebok and um, Shaquille O'Neal and working with some um, Shack Attacks. And she needed a designer to help get the uh, design across. And I was able to collab with them and make that happen. So that was a pretty unique experience for me because it's not something that I normally do on a regular basis, but it was a unique project that really taught me a lot. With respect to the things that you design versus designing sneakers, did you find it to be more challenging or it was easy to adapt? It is a little bit more challenging because there's more voices to include. I feel like obviously the smaller the circle, the easier it is to kind of boom, boom, get things done. Um, when you have more voices at the table, you have to kind of um, equate for every little thing. And that was something too that I had to learn um, to, to do on a better basis. So I wanted to tie back earlier on in the conversation, you touched about diversity in tech, and we know that's such like a huge topic these days. So in your own words, if you could describe what does diversity in tech mean to you? It's representation, really. Um, When we talk about diversity and breaking that down, it's just literally representation of voices. And that is something that I feel like obviously is lacking, specifically in the tech industry but even more so having that type of diversity represented in places where there's not as much diversity. Um, Being that type of game changer, not a lot of people who are diverse want to be that type of person who wants to be out there in that way. And I feel like it's super important that we start having those conversations amongst each other and uh, specifically within the diverse community, but then also um, representing all those voices as much as possible, as loudly as we can so that other people realize they're not the only one in the room. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And in your opinion, like, why do you think it has taken quite some time? Like there is progress, but I personally feel like it's kind of been like a slow, gradual progress. I completely agree. Um, one of the things, one of the bullet points I had in my head was how can we change that? How can we change that 1% of executive leads in the tech industry being people of color? How can we make that three? How can we make that 5% opportunity? I feel like over the years, there's more now than there ever has been, but exposure to capital investment for people of color, I think is extremely crucial um, to have. And I think that kind of helps make or break a lot of startups in the first two years of business. So that's one. And then two, being able to seek resources to balance stronger business development skills. Again, most of us who are starting up, we're only good at that one thing, right? Most of us who are starting up like video game companies and coding companies, you know, we're just good coders and we just had this ability to create a business. And we have to realize too, when we're starting a business, we're no longer just that coder anymore. Now we're the coder and the secretary and the HR and all the research that goes into that. So understanding and seeking those resources to better balance the skills that you don't have, I feel is is incredibly important skill to learn and to grow over time in scaling your business. I don't know about you, but do you happen to take note, say, when you go to events, conferences, and when you listen, watch people speak on the panel, do you take note if there is diversity represented? Absolutely, I do. Okay. Um, I thought it was the, like, the only one or one of the, f- the few people, but then I started to have more conversations with them. It's, it's strange. I guess you kind of just do like a, a quick mental inventory. So you're like, okay, there's like this many so-and-so, this many so-and-so. It just, I don't know. It's just one of the, like, it's always been automatic for me. <laughs> Absolutely. And I feel like that's totally innate to people of color, period. We always want to see ourselves we wanna, in other places. When we see people being successful, we want to envision ourselves being successful. And the best way for us to see that is to see other people like us do it. So (laughs) I feel like it's extremely important to have that representation on stage, in the crowds, um, in the vendor booths or on the markets. It's extremely important for us to see that so that we can see it can be done. It is possible. We can break those barriers. Mm -hmm. And then with not just diversity in tech, we we need it pretty much in every industry because like the population itself is diverse. And then like having a diverse workforce, a diverse community, it helps provide different ideas, experience and insight. Absolutely. Again, going back to what diversity is, what is that? It's the accumulation of different voices. And when 
we have more different voices at the table, we're allowing more opportunities for change. When we're not allowing other voices to be seen or heard at the table, we're only getting one monotonous voice and echo chambers are real. <laughs> mm-hmm. Even just thinking with respect to like owning a business, I had this weird idea or I guess the stereotypical idea that, oh, okay, it's, it's mainly men who are in business or you have to be very extroverted and have charisma and, you know, be this attention seeker. But then after reading a lot more and then reading more profiles of leader, a lot of them are actually introverts. And I myself, like I consider myself to be a huge introvert. And then reading that has, you know, given me like comfort and made me realize like, yeah, I can be a leader even though I'm an introvert. And really that's not, that's not even like, I shouldn't even consider it to be a hindrance. Absolutely. I too am an introvert. I consider myself an introvert. My, my husband, my kids probably will tell me, no, you're not. But I, <laughs> I think I, everybody does. Yeah. You know, when you say introvert, like, no, you're not. I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Continue, please. Oh, no, you're fine. I have a lot of moments where I am, you know, high energy when I'm in front of clientele or businesses or have an event. And then for the next week to two weeks, I will be a slow recluse in my home. <laughs> in my PJs, um, binging Netflix shows, things along those lines while crafting. Um, so I have a good balance of, um, right now, I have a good balance of better understanding when to be forward, but then also to remember to refresh myself inward. And that helps kind of balance um, the ebb and flow of what's required of me, both as a mom, as a professional, and as a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like, I'll do the the events and like get all the energy like yeah yeah okay but yeah after that say few hours or that day or half day I'm like okay I'm good <laughs> like maybe in a few weeks then I can go back to it it's just funny I guess people who aren't as introverted and often like my mom or like other people ask because I spent most of my time at home working for home and they'll say like aren't you like lonely do you feel like are you okay I'm like no actually I, I really love being alone because there is a difference between being lonely and being alone <laughs> completely agree <laughs> Yeah, I just think like if I was to be on a deserted island, I think I'd be okay as long as I had like Wi-Fi and a few books, then I'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> just leave me with Wi-Fi. I'll figure everything else out. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think there will be more advances in tech to come up with um, solutions and ways to apply more diversity? Absolutely. I, I already see a lot of more intentional spaces. Um, we look at amazing conventions like Afrotech and we look at amazing um, communities that are being built specifically around people of color. Um, When we talk about a a similar group that we're a part of, the Women of Color podcasters, bringing tons of people together in one virtual space and we're hearing voices and we're sharing feedback. Those are intentional ways that we can um, start creating a stronger voice for ourselves and then amplifying that so other people outside of the circles can hear and see us. Mm -hmm. I was just even thinking of a a small example, emojis, like now they have different skin tones. If you choose like a high five and thumbs up and sometimes I'm like, oh, I want to choose like all the skin tones to represent (laughs) everyone. (laughs) I do that. I do that often sometimes with my social media posts. Instead of just doing like a yellow thumb, I'll do, you know, white, a medium blend and then a really dark thumb because I want to include as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And this is just more of like a side note, but I remember uh, when I was younger, with makeup, there were some popular brands that there wasn't a shade that that was like meant for me. It was kind of like either all really, really light or really, really dark and not that too many in the mm-hmm. middle. So I found it took me a while to find like a f- the, the few brands that actually had a shade that best fit me. And I guess like maybe at that time, you know, they, they weren't really aware, but like I've noticed now they're more um, makeup brands. They have a wide ar- array of shades for people of different color. Absolutely. And that, again, comes to attest what power of influence and influence is in our community. Um, mm-hmm. Again, being able to see ourselves in the products that we use, being able to see ourselves in, in the clothes that we wear, or being able to see ourselves in the advertisements or the leaders in the industry specifically. So I think that's super important. Repres- representation totally matters. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Even though we've been going on about like diversity in tech and tech, I wanted to chat about something more low tech, such as books. <laughs> so what are some books would you say that you have changed your life or changed your way of thinking? Oh, wow. Okay. So because I also host a podcast, I hear a lot of tools and resources that are shared with me specifically on stories. So stories kind of been my 
my pivot in some areas in regards to digital marketing, because that is a big part of what I do is telling other people's story. So some resources recently that was kind of provided to me um, was, I can't think of his last name, first name's Carl. So let me go get it right now while I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> But that was a really big one and actually did some homework on him specifically, looking at some of his earlier books, just kind of better understanding what is uh, required of, of that. Hold on one second, I'll pull it up. I was so surprised because I was like, this is just not my normal thing. But I love story enough. And this was one of the early founders of developing good story. And so that really triggered a lot of things for me. And I really wanted to kind of share that with people. Um, here we go. It is... Patrick Drury was the one that brought this up to me. Joseph Campbell. Woo! There you go. Um, he is a world-renowned mythologist, and he has a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And Sorry, I'm... could you repeat that? The Hero with a Thousand Faces? Correct. That is oh, right. Oh, cool. Hero with a Thousand Faces, again, made from Joseph Campbell, who's a world-renowned mythologist. And it was super important for me to better understand story by our starting to read a lot of his work specifically. So it's just really epic. The first time you read it, I've been told several times, you're going to be like, what? <laughs> but then the more you start reading it and maybe kind of reframing your brain a little bit, the more it starts to make deeper um, sense to you. And I, I'm in that place right now where I'm just kind of rediscovering the really crucial parts of his words that are talking about developing a story and what that means psychologically to a person. Yeah, it, it's such a huge part of digital marketing now, of like sales and marketing in general, because before it was more of a one-way conversation. Like I, I just think of back of to people who go door to door and they just kind of try and sell you something, right? Whereas now, as you see, there's always like a story behind it. And I feel when you have a story behind your, your service and your product, it just makes it so much more compelling. Absolutely. I completely agree. It's actually a part of some of the, the marketing tips or importance of marketing that I talk about often. You know, marketing is essential to make or break your business, but it is not required for you to come out guns blazing. It's important that people instantly connect to you, whether by service or by story, even if they're not interested in you. But the fact that you're telling your story, letting people know that you're putting yourself out there is a connection magnet. Okay, so before we uh, close off the conversation, I'd like to ask you, what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh man, be probably be, be patient. That was something I was, I was very impatient. I'm still kind of impatient, but I, I think kids kind of helped mellow me down a little bit. <laughs> um, I was incredibly impatient as a young person and I just wanted everything to happen overnight or happen in a very short amount of time. And what I had to realize was that in a lot of ways, um, in order to develop something, you need to uh, take the time to develop it. Um, and that means that it may take a week, it may take a month, it may take a year to get where you need to go, but you'll get there. Again, kind of the whole mysterious, you know, the, the part of it, the importance of the journey is not necessarily the destination, but it's, you know, the journey of getting there. And that's really what I wish I could tell my younger self was enjoy the journey instead of focusing so much on getting to the end of the race. Mm -hmm. Me too. I'm an impatient person. Like I, I can't help it. I, yeah. It's almost if like I want everything done now or I want it done yesterday. Yeah. But I definitely agree with you to focus on the journey. And I guess maybe not even to really be so hell -bent. I'm like, oh, this needs to be done right away. But yeah, it's the progress. Like the progress makes such a huge difference versus saying, okay, was I in a different place than where I started say a year ago or even like six months ago? And if there was progress, then I, I'm pretty satisfied with that. Absolutely. And that can be measured in so many different ways. Again, one of the ways that I kind of measure that success is, you know, one, being yourself. I encourage people all the time, my clientele, um, anyone listening, Earshot Range, we know that I'm a huge advocate of being yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, then no one else will either. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Totally understanding that. And then two, learning when to pivot because um, you're not going to get it right all the time. You're going to fail. Actually, failure is great because you're learning from what is working and what is not working. Mm -hmm. So if you're understanding that you have to learn to pivot, that is something huge that will help you later on as you grow and realize what you do want and what you don't want. And then also learning to keep it moving because that's a big part of progress is you are moving all the time. Agree 100%. So if people wanted to get in touch with you online, where could they find you? Gosh, Octane Designs, um, that is true across the board. That's Instagram, Octane Designs, Twitter, Octane Designs, Pinterest, Octane Designs. 
and uh, Facebook at Octane Design. So pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, very important with branding too, to having the same name if possible across the board. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, super important. And of course, you can always check out my blog, the podcast at lexoctane.com. Great. Thank you so much again for chatting with today. It was a lot of fun. Yes. Thank you, Karen. I'm so excited. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in and stay tuned for more episodes. Ciao for now. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Bacon Bits and Bites podcast. If you enjoyed the content, please subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, and share this podcast with your family and friends. You can follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Bacon Bits and Bites. And on Twitter, it's Bacon Bits underscore Bites. Ciao for now!